uh, I've had the uh, the great opportunity to be able to uh, volunteer in ancient Corinth uh, for the last 10 years with the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, and um, it's it's a dream job, free but a dream job, and. Uh, but during that time, I've also gotten to know a lot of local people and just observe the interactions between, uh, between them and uh, visitors. And I've always wondered, considering the fact that the site has been there for over 100 years, what it's like growing up next to a site. Not actually working on it, although most people either have or have relatives that have. But just being adjacent to it. Uh, so I, I arranged to meet with uh, local people, particularly older people, and wanted to know what their perspectives and, and what it was like growing up there. And um, initially uh, set up a full formal form with check boxes and everything and looked at it, looked at it, and I thought, this isn't the way to go about this. I need to just have these people tell their stories. And, uh, and they love to. So um, one of my first things and uh, the most important thing that I wanted to find out was about their childhood and, and being near the site and their perceptions. And uh, universally, uh, people said, the site has not changed. Uh, and it was their perception of the site from the perspective that they see. If they're not working on it or anything, what they're seeing is the frontage and it has been the same way. Uh, by the way, there are no people in this that have been involved. Uh, they've got anonymity, so I'm just putting pretty pictures up. Um, so they all said that the site hadn't changed. and. So from where they are, and the site has progressed back, uh, it has it, it is not changed in the way that they would see it. Uh, a number of them expressed that uh, Charles Williams uh, was doing uh, test sites throughout the area, but apart from that, they weren't seeing a lot of evolution in the site. In their families, they there was no discussion of uh, the site, and in their schools, there was no discussion of the site. So a lot of them uh, grew up not knowing the histories or, or any, of the, any of the reasons why the site was significant. Uh, in so much as they, it was a playground. Uh, one, one person expressed to me the fact that uh, the school, which is uh, right up against the edge of the site, before the uh, fence went around the whole site, if your teacher wanted you to answer a question and you didn't know it, the answer, when she turned, you jumped out the window and went down into what they referred to consistently as the catacombs, which is through the Pyrene waterworks. And, uh, and some of the areas uh, in the East Stoa uh, have been covered with concrete. Um, some of the wellheads have been covered with concrete for the safety of tourists. Uh, I, and keep in mind, this is these people's words and not my words. So some are inaccurate, some are conflicting. But uh, they were saying that uh, Charles Williams was concerned about the uh, uh, tourists getting hurt, and so he had those capped off. So that ended some of their fun. But uh, this is the place that they would play and particularly in the more dangerous places, uh, uh, all throughout the waterworks where you know, people were dying of disease, and uh, which you know, a lot of our childhoods were like that. My parents would say, don't go to the sawmill or the gravel pit or the railroad, so we'd go to the sawmill and catch the train to the gravel pit. Um, but you know, we come out the other end and they have all of these memories, but they go beyond what I would have thought uh, because uh, much older people were telling stories about how they would play on uh, Acro Corinth and, uh, and be finding artifacts everywhere and uh, that they found um, 
British grenades from World War II and were setting them off on the far side of Accra Corinth. And a number of people said that as children, before the site was fenced, if it rained, the children would run out to the site because that's when the coins appear. And they would, they would gather the coins and, you know, as any child would. This is another reason for anonymity. Um, but so the site to them was just a playground and uh, one woman told me that, uh, you know, we never discussed this. I taught myself about the site as I got older and realized there's something significant here. She said, my grandfather's goats grazed around the temple. And uh, so th that was interesting. I, I, I imagined being in awe of this thing if I was living next to it, but uh, perhaps that's coming from a background where there wasn't something so awesome. Uh, they talked about the poverty at, after the Civil War and how uh, initially, and, and not having shoes and, um, and having one pair of canvas shoes just to go to church. And the, uh, the thing is that tourists started to trickle in. And that tourist money, you show someone around or take them up Acro Corinth, and suddenly you've got 10 times as much money as you would have had in the, the next few months. So the site was affecting them economically that way. The site has the, and uh, Betsy Robinson had a great shot of um, the, um, the tip that they were uh, building as they excavated with all of the rail cars. That tip is now, and Betsy would know better than I, but uh, probably 150, 200 meters long, uh, 30 meters tall, and uh, 50, 75 meters wide. It's got um, a cultural area on it with stages. It's got uh, a, uh, what was a government hotel on it. And uh, the thing is that that whole town was physically reshaped by having excavations there. And, and yes, the, the goats. Um, and so also in talking to them, their perceptions of, um, their perceptions of the people involved in digging um, I, were, I, was, I didn't know if I was going to get uh, ambiguity or negativity or, and it was overwhelming how positive the people's reactions were to the archaeology going on, to the American school. Um, what I ended up perceiving was that Charles Williams is, is still perceived as a local folk hero for a, a number of reasons. And uh, so th that was one perception that I had changed. And, and the other was the fence around the site. And uh, I had thought that maybe it would be a contentious issue that there was a fence put around the site and that this group or that group would be blamed. No one had a problem with it. And the fence, uh, when it was put in, uh, all local residents still had full access for free. And so uh, all of the guards at that time were also local people, and so they knew who, who was who, and everyone could get in. Uh, but I was told stories about, uh, by the people justifying the fence that I thought they would take offense to and uh, telling stories about a, uh, watching one tourist walking off of the site just with a marble element over his shoulder that he was going to leave with or a tour bus that as it was leaving came to a halt and had the tourists coming out and picking up things before they continued on their way. So they saw this as, as something that was completely justified. And um, yeah, no one had a problem. And uh, then in talking about uh, uh, archaeological restrictions in the area and everything, you know, people 
while they while they would um, take note that yes, they did exist. Um, they also said that things have gotten much better with the, with regulations, and also that uh, one woman said, if it weren't for restrictions, there would be souvlaki stands on the site. So, the the only contentious issue I ended up seeing was that people were talking about um, the tour groups that come in and the foreign tour companies and what they were doing is uh, taking people into the site and quite often it's uh, religious groups that want to go to the BIMA and, it's, uh, and they would bring them in but rather than going through the rest of the site, they leave again. And the problem that was happening with merchants was they didn't, since they weren't going through the exit, the tourists didn't go past all their shops and restaurants. They came back out and got onto the buses and left. And when they leave, they go just out of town to one souvenir place, buy all of their stuff, and that is actually a financial arrangement between that place and the tour companies. So uh, some of these people um, started their shops to be able to have their retirement, to be able to have a business for their kids, and they keep the lights off all day and they hope that one, maybe two people come in. So, um, so it was actually elements that aren't even a part of the whole village that were perceived as a problem. And uh, it was just, um, I would like to know more about um, what, what their perceptions are, maybe further back from the retail area. Um, uh, I did get to talk with some ex-conservators, um, and uh, they, they were able to just, we didn't talk about any of the politics, what we discussed was what it was like to be able to do the job back in the day. That was very interesting because uh, up until 1958 uh, there was no electricity in Corinth uh, and I was told that uh, that uh, the American school had seen uh, ahead that they would eventually have it so they uh, built with the ability to have it. But all of the conserva uh, conservation efforts were done just by the light coming through the windows. So then we discu started discussing lighting in their homes. Everyone was using oil lamps, and then I did have to ask, uh, because of uh, Dorina Malou's research, did you use lumini wicks, the little, uh, little weed wicks? And I was told, oh, every house. We all had them floating in the oil and burning. So that's another research project to do. And that's my short perception of what it was like to grow up in ancient Corinth. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Colin. Any questions? Yeah, um, I'm just interested if you want to continue on this research. Are you planning to to ask for other uh, questions or continue with the interviews in this area? I would like to actually. I'd like to look at other communities that have been really close to uh, uh, long-term archaeological sites and see what kind of economic effects and uh, and social effects that they've had. Hopefully. Yeah, uh, you said that uh, it uh, that uh, you didn't expect uh, such uh, a relationship towards these uh, ruins because maybe you didn't grow up in such a nice environment, right? Yes. Yes, and on the other hand, those people that you were interviewing were all growing up in pretty harsh conditions, without. Uh, after the war without electricity in the poverty that we cannot imagine in present day. So do you think that the circumstances of their growing up were different? Would they perceive Corinth differently? So if you were to remove the archaeological site and just make it... No, if you would 
to remove their uh, if their conditions of growing up were better. Ah, oh, okay. Well, when you look at uh, the aftermath of World War II and um, and of the Civil War, their circumstances wouldn't have been better in another village that didn't have an archaeological site. So they end up uh, slowly, but they, they get a benefit that some other villages wouldn't get as tourism starts to come in, as uh, uh, they're able to actually uh, sell the skills and crafts they have, as the uh, villagers are able to work and develop skill sets on the archaeological site, uh, the site changes everything for that village when it's juxtaposed to something identical that doesn't have archaeology. Okay, thanks. Uh, Matt? Hi. Yeah, that, that was a great presentation and I, I was interested in the, um, the you were saying that the, the forms you used to begin with just didn't work at all and, and I love that kind of shift over to getting them to tell their stories and how they, that just flowed out of them so to speak and, and I think that's such an imp intimidating to them yeah yeah and uh, I was kind of intrigued by that story of the grandmother's ghost and the ruins. And I wondered if you could just embellish it a little. That's, that's too okay. This was one person who was talking about how uh, the same person who told, uh, well, one of them that was telling me about how they didn't learn about the site in school, that they didn't talk about it at the dinner table, no mention of the history was made. It was. It was just the plot of land that happened to be there with stone things on it. So yeah, I, I loved the, we end up laughing about that. I love the image of the goats wandering around and it might not be a bad idea for fire suppression to maybe continue that. Anyone else? Okay, if not, we can move to the last presentation. Presentation by Holly Wright and Julian Richards, Archaeological, Archaeology Data Services, 